subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello and welcome uh, to the print. Uh, you, we are together in this special program called the Reporters Direct. Uh, this is actually a feature that has been introduced by the print, especially and only and only for uh, you, uh, my dear subscribers. Uh, before I go further, I would really like to thank you for subscribing to the print. Thank you for supporting the print. And thank you for supporting the work done by me and my colleagues. As you're aware, you know, during this entire pandemic, um, you know, my colleagues have been traveling all across the country, uh, visiting, you know, uh, areas which no other uh, reporters or media organizations were visiting. The entire effort was to ensure that you as a viewer, as a reader, uh, gets the latest stories uh, happening all across the country. As part of this initiative, you know, I have also traveled during this uh, particular lockdown, but uh, but then it was more to do with defense and security related matters. Uh, last year, I was in uh, Kashmir um, and I visited the forward areas in Kashmir, interacted with the soldiers there. Uh, last week, I was actually in uh, Jammu and I visited the LOC on this Jammu side. Uh, this was uh, this was the uh, this was the Poonch as well as the Bimba Gali sector. Now, the Bimba Gali sector is commonly known as the BG sector. Now, both these areas have witnessed uh, intense ceasefire violations in the past, uh, from mortar shedding to sniping. You know, these things uh, are kind of a daily occurrences. But since the uh, since 25 February this year, uh, both India and Pakistan, the DGMO, DGMOs as Director General of Military Operations, spoke to each other and both agreed to implement a ceasefire that was uh, signed in way back in 2003. So since then, the guns have fallen silent on the LOC as well as the IB. Uh, but yes, uh, the infiltration continues to be a concern. There have been two infiltration, successful infiltration attempts in the recent past, uh, in which, uh, of course, we've shot down terrorists, but we also lost uh, uh, two soldiers who made the supreme sacrifice while uh, countering this particular infiltration. And... Uh, uh, also, you know, while there is, of course, ceasefire, there is no firing that is taking place. Uh, there is no let up in the activity or the daily work of the soldier as such. So the, so the soldiers continue to patrol the LOC, set up ambushes, uh, carry out uh, surveillance, fortify the positions uh, because they have to, because they are working under the impression that there would be infiltration that would be taking place. So soldiers, while, you know, the villagers around the LOC can, um, you know, heave a sigh of relief, because there are no shells, they can live a normal life, as I had reported earlier uh, on the print. Uh, but the soldiers can't live a normal life. You know, their normal life is uh, being on alert 24 into 7. Uh, so, as I said, this is a new initiative. The reporters direct is a new initiative where I get to talk to uh, you know subscribers of the print, uh, you know, people who've supported us, and I get to answer your questions. So please uh, feel free, you can uh, send in your questions. There is a chat box here that I'll monitor. There are first uh, questions uh, that have been sent by, uh, you know, some of you earlier itself. So I have those questions with me. I'll read out the names and all. But feel free to uh, ask questions while this particular session is, is on. And uh, the first question that has come that I'll be taking up is from Sudipto Bhomik. Now, Sudhita has asked two questions, and uh, one of his questions is, the first question that Sudhita has asked is, how can India leverage strategic advantage of Lakshudi? And the second question is that recently we are hearing the PLA did some incursion after Dalai Lama's birthday. Is it true? If yes, when can we do the same with them in a tit-for-tat tactics? Well, uh, as far as uh, Sudhita, as far as Lakshudi is concerned, uh, by the way, uh, uh, viewers, I'm so sorry, I'll have to uh, I'll keep looking in uh, to these papers. You know, the font is really small, so I'll have to look closer. Along with, I'll be keeping track of what's happening here. So uh, don't think that I'm uh, that I'm uh, that I'm looking. I'm doing multiple things and not giving hundred percent concentration. The hundred percent concentration goes to you only. So uh, the uh, so as far as the first question is concerned, uh, the strategic advantage of Lashuti, I can tell you for the fact that India. Uh, India, especially the Indian Navy, is indeed using the strategic advantage of Lakshadweep. As you rightly mentioned, uh, Lakshadweep does provide a, uh, a strategic advantage, uh, especially in wake of uh, China's increased activity in the Indian Ocean region. I'll not get into uh, what specific areas uh, the Navy is 
Navy is doing. Uh, but I can tell you, yes, that uh, India is fairly using the strategic advantage of Lashwadeep. The other question was recently we were having, uh, we, we are hearing that the PLA did some incursion after Dalai Lama's birthday. Well, uh, 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 well, uh, uh, Sudipto, uh, I have not reported on it. Uh, I have not, uh, so you would not uh, see that story in the print. Uh, this is precisely because uh, uh, I, uh, from uh, what I know, is uh, totally different. Yes, of course, there was the, the videos had emerged of you know the Chinese uh, PLA troops standing with uh, what you call with a banner objecting to the celebrations that was happening um, uh, in 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 a particular area in Ladakh uh, for Dalai Lama's birthday. But uh, from what I'm here, from what I'm hearing is that, yes, the Chinese did show those banners, but then one will really have to see where the Chinese were. Did the Chinese actually intrude into the Indian territory and show those banners with the Chinese standing on Indian territory or were they standing on their own territory, you know, a territory which is under them for long. So I think, uh, I think uh, uh, I would, it would be, uh, I think, from what I gather is that the Chinese were not on Indian territory. Uh, then I have a question coming in from uh, Connie Menzers. And he's asking, why do we lag behind in defense, especially in decision-making so slow by the time decisions are taken, the equipment technology is outdated. Why can't we have many more private sector companies in defense? Well, that's a very important uh, question that you asked, uh, uh, Connie, and that is something which which I even I wonder. You know, uh, today earlier today I was doing a government matters with my colleague Rui Tiwari, and I was mentioning this that even uh, our procurement process is such that there are multiple layers to it. Is that even if everything is fast tracked from the time of initiating a proposal to signing, it would at least take four to five years. That is at best when when everything is completely you know smoothened out and work is uh, done on priority despite that it will take four to five years so you can understand what happens in normal cases uh, there is no doubt about the fact that uh, this whole uh, there needs to be a major rehaul of uh, the way that we go ahead and process not just in terms of procedures that have been put in place but also in terms of thinking and as far as private sector is concerned uh, I think it's an initiative that both the government as well as the private sector has to take. Um, and for me, I've always argued that Make in India doesn't mean just uh, you know getting TOT and manufacturing things here. I think uh, Make in India would, will also involve a lot of research and development because that is where the future is. If you have to uh, win the wars of the future, it has to be done on our own indigenous strength. That is very important. I have a question uh, from... Uh, Bab Patel, also from Vadodara, just like uh, Connie, and his question is, do you think that India accepting disengagement only in Pangong so big is not a wise option instead of full disengagement in one go along the LAC? This is especially so since we... Well, uh, I'll, I'll agree with you on this. I have always uh, been uh, uh, in favor of, uh, nego uh, of negotiating the entire stretch rather than doing it uh, in pieces because this actually en ends up working in advantage of the Chinese. And I, I think many of us can say this uh, because it has happened. It's in a hindsight, we can say this. At that particular uh, uh, you know, uh, time when the talks were on, I think there were multiple uh, factors that came into play. Some of these factors are not even in the public domain. However, I know some of these factors, some factors I would not even be aware. So there were multiple factors that came into play behind this decision. Uh, now that uh, this decision has been taken and disengagement has happened, we can see that uh, uh, the Chinese have refused to disengage from other locations. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's going to be a long haul as far as this particular round of tensions is concerned. I can tell you for the fact that I've not yet tweeted on another story, but I was just before uh, you know, I logged into this program, I was speaking to a source and I was asking what, when is the next round of talks because it was expected. And what I've been told is that the next round of talks will be held immediately after the Kargil Vijay Divas. That is, it could be end of July or even the first week of August. Now I have a live question which is coming in from Jay Desai. This is this is Jay. I'm a security analyst. I would like to okay. Can I have 
He says, I would like to publish my articles in the opinion section of the print. Can I have your mail ID so that you can review and publish it? Well, uh, Jay, thank you uh, for your message. And actually, the opinions uh, uh, page is handled by a different team altogether. It is headed by uh, my colleague, Rama Lakshmi. But feel free to uh, write in to me. Um, uh, and uh, my email ID is snehish.philip at the rate the, uh, the print dot in. It is actually, it's also there on the on my Twitter bio. I have a question coming in from uh, Gurdeep Mahal from New Delhi. I'll just quickly because this, okay. Uh, Gurdeep Mahal from New Delhi, where his question is not visible here. Uh, I have also a question coming in from Sanjay from Mumbai. And okay. Okay. I have a question coming in from me, uh, Sai Kiran, who's, uh, who's asking, Hi, Snehish, defense forces are known to keep secretive. How do you get information out of them? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it's my job uh, of covering the defense uh, forces, the, 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 the hierarchy in the defense, and if many people in the defense know me, we interact with each other on a daily basis. I think there's a trust which is uh, which is built, and uh, so that's that's the job of a journalist to get our information. And uh, so, but however we may do, uh, so so yeah. So I think it's based on trust, and that is how it works. I have a question coming in from uh, Arpit S. And he's asking, can you please talk about how the security forces plan on dealing with Pakistan terror groups using drones for espionage, SLS for attacks, not just from Pakistan side, but also from militants within our territory, uh, including Naxalites, perhaps also how they plan on countering drones sent by the PLA, Army, Navy, and the Air Force in the near future. Uh, you know, thank you for your question, Arpit. I think uh, there's already work that is on on uh, counter drone measures. Now, as I mentioned earlier in my report, there is no country in the world which can guarantee 100% counter drone measures. Now, these drones have been a matter of concern. The recent attack at the Air Force Station in Jammu has shown how uh, dangerous these drones can be. You know, these are commercial, uh, commercially available drones which can be tweaked, explosives can be added onto it, and it can either be dropped. Uh, uh, through a drone or the drone itself can uh, act as an ID. So uh, there are counter drone measures that are in place, but not uh, to the full extent uh, ever. India has actually been lagging behind other countries when it comes to counter drone measures or for that matter, even drones. Uh, at least now you have uh, you know, uh, private firms in the country developing drones. Uh, for example, the army has gone in for uh, procurement of tactical uh, high altitude drones from a, a Bangalore based company. Uh, there is a counter drone measure that has been developed by uh, the DRDO. However, it is it, it needs to be fine tuned, uh, and the both the, th the three services have already put out uh, you know tenders or as they say the RFP and the RFI uh, for counter drone measures, uh, and this this would be an uh, area of immense focus in the coming uh, months and years. As I remember, also remember that uh, the drone technology is still evolving. What you've seen uh, in Jammu, the use of a drone to drop an explosive, is just the initial uh, exploitation of this drone. So one really doesn't know how this whole technology is going to evolve. And every time a technology evolves, there is also a counter technology that needs to be evolved. I think it's all part of the process and it will happen. Uh, I have a question coming in from uh, uh, Mr. Jain from Pune. And he's asking, does this Pakistan ceasefire really has any meaning? Well, I can tell you for the fact that uh, ever since the ceasefire, the guns have fallen silent at the LC. Uh, the soldiers, however, continue to uh, do their daily patrol set up ambushes to counter uh, the threat. Uh, but however, they also can, uh, you know, uh, breathe a sigh of relief because there are no sniping activity. There are no mortars that have been fired. So uh, this is actually a period for the forces, uh, for the security forces to... Uh, regroup, uh, also, you know, uh, tighten up uh, 
you know, the security uh, uh, infrastructure there. As far as the villages are concerned, this has come as a real boon for the villages. You know, I, I went to about four villages along the LOC. I interacted with the villagers and it was nice to see uh, children play. And I was talking to a 10-year-old uh, boy and asked him and he was playing around. So, and he, he told me that in a normal, uh, during ceasefire violation, any normal day, he couldn't be out in open for so much time. Uh, and he couldn't really play along with his friends in the open because there was always a fear of a mortar uh, landing uh, nearby. And all these villages along the LOC, uh, you know, comes uh, comes under the, uh, um, you know, the range of uh, the mortars as well as other artillery that is fired by the security uh, forces, by the Pakistani security forces. Now I have a question uh, from... Okay, just a sec. I have a question coming in from uh, Guy Sasi, and he's asking, will India be able, and he's from Mumbai, and he's asking, will India be able to balance China with, without becoming a stooge of the US? Will Taliban and Pakistan unite against India? Well, uh, I, I really don't know why India would end up becoming a stooge of the USA. Uh, you know, I, I don't think so. That's what any government or anybody would want uh, India to be. Uh, however, yes, there is no doubt about the fact that given the geopolitics in, uh, in place, India uh, is moving nearer to uh, the US. However, at the same time, it also maintains excellent equation with uh, Russia. It maintains excellent equation with France, uh, with UK, uh, Australia for that matter, Japan uh, uh, for that matter. So I, I, I would not really agree to the fact that India is becoming a stooge of the US per se. Uh, will Taliban and Pakistan unite against India? There is no doubt about the fact that Taliban and Pakistan will eventually unite against uh, India. And this was one of the stories that I had done uh, during my interaction uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, in which uh, it was it was mentioned that, that one of the biggest concerns that the security forces uh, have is the fact that once this entire drawdown is completed, once Taliban really, uh, you know, consolidates its power in Afghanistan, you could have a situation where uh, some of these foreign fighters could move to Kashmir. This is what something, this is like history repeating itself. It was way back in 1988-89 when foreign fighters, that is the Pakistanis, the Afghans, Tajiks and others, who came in from Kashmir once the USSR uh, withdrew from Afghanistan. So you could have a situation that is something that needs to be really taken care of. But at the same time, the situation is much different uh, from what it was then. It is not so easy for Pakistan and uh, the Taliban to, um, uh, to move any of their fighters into Kashmir without global scrutiny, without global condemnation. Uh, however, the fear, remember that you know, it, it, Taliban itself is not the fear. Taliban is made up of a number of factions. So those factions are the concern. And in Afghanistan, there are also not, not everybody who's fighting the Americans or others is ideologically linked to Taliban. There are also mercenaries out there who fight for money. So if once this war ends in Afghanistan and once and if and when the Taliban establishes power, you know, these, 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 uh, these mercenaries will have no job. They will need somewhere to fight. And the fear at that time, the fear is that Pakistan would then divert these mercenaries uh, towards Jammu and Kashmir. I have, a, uh, I have now a question coming in from, okay, I have a question coming in from Verma and Lukesha Verma at Gmail. And, uh, okay, uh, then I have a question from Biswas from Chennai is asking, given the shortage in fighter aircraft, do you see Rafal's been ordered or Will we hold on given the current controls in France and LCA will take time to be deployed in numbers? Well, you know, LCA uh, and Rafale cannot be compared. They are two, both two different category completely. LCA, as the name suggests, a light combat aircraft, uh, whereas uh, Rafale is a multi role uh, or as the Dassault Aviation says, omni role aircraft. Um, We've ordered in for 36. There is a uh, RFP 414 that is supposed to be come, uh, that is supposed to come out. But uh, from whatever that I've reported, from whatever interactions that I have, if I have to bet my money on uh, which how many uh, you know which are the next set of aircrafts that would be ordered, the 114. I think India will eventually not go in for the 114 aircraft. India is likely to go in for a repeat order 
of uh, the rafale this could be another 36 rafales that could be ordered uh, the price of these rafales would be much cheaper than the 136 ordered remember that uh, and why i'm telling you this is because uh, the 36 rafale i think was was the deal worked out to be about 8.78 billion dollars uh, this included about 1.3 billion sorry not dollars euros this included about 1.3 billion euros for india specific enhancements these these were one time payments that were so uh, uh so it doesn't really matter whether you order 36 rafales or 100 rafales or 400 rafales the 1.3 billion was uh you know uh, the money that was made for integration or uh, study and uh, research and development of india specific enhancements so that money has been paid so any future deal will not have this 1.3 now another uh, uh, cost factor for this uh, for this rafale aircraft was the setting up of two bases infrastructure so you have one uh, in the west uh, for the western theater and one in the east that is hasimara which is uh, likely to be operationalized uh, uh, this month itself so uh, so there was cost involved so this particular deal also included the cost for setting up of these two bases so these two bases can easily accommodate two more squadrons of rafale so uh, so when if if at all the next order for another 36 is placed even this cost can be deducted from the overall cost so which means that uh, the the prices will further drop then there are multiple elements to it so i think the next uh, this was about for 8.7.878 billion euros the next one should work out to be anywhere around 5 billion euros and um, uh, and the vanilla price of the aircraft is different then you add up the cost of uh, you know missiles of uh, india specific enhancements logistics performance based uh, logistics under which the rafale is the tus aviation is contract bound uh, to make at least 75% or 85% of the aircraft av available at any point of uh, time i have a question okay let me just look which question uh, what was the last question that i had spoken about okay i have a question from rama swami he is asking india keeps insisting that they will only resolve border with pakistan in bilateral talks but do you think any indian government will have the political will to accept loc as a formal border see the practic uh, loc as a uh, formal border is uh, is uh, you know the parliament has passed a resolution which says that uh you know uh, the pok is also an integral part of uh, kashmir i think uh, there was a plan that was initiated way back during atal bihari vajpayee's uh, government when general musharraf was the president at that time i think that was the closest that the uh, two governments could get to normalizing the relationship where the loc was almost like a working boundary or uh, was not really a border per se but more like a working boundary which had um you know a uh, match uh, with people of both sides visiting each other it was more freer so this was something that was uh, that was being planned during watchpay stenia but uh, so if you ask me personally uh, while yes uh, the pok continues to be uh, an integral part of uh, of india but uh, on a but on a practical basis i think uh, there needs to be more work done and uh, the loc itself can uh, transform uh, into uh some kind of a working boundary or something that was discussed then during the india government with musharraf i think a lot more needs to be done on this particular front okay i have a i have a question coming in from chakravarti and he is asking why does india not have intelligence capability to anticipate issues that keep popping up every decade regularly we seem to be immune visibly in the public eye when it comes to police around the globe and out in the neighbor okay uh, i really didn't understand your question but uh, as far as intelligence capability is concerned yes we have uh, uh, we do have uh, credible intelligence agencies uh, and uh, remember that the adversary has only to succeed only once uh the good guys that is uh, that is the agencies and the security forces have to succeed always so while of course we all come to know about uh, the failure of the intelligence agencies there are multiple successes uh, which never come out uh, primarily because first they don't speak about it second uh, and the reason why they don't speak about it is that uh, any public you know in 
any information coming out publicly hampers the future operations. So hence, uh, that is something which uh, uh, they don't talk about, the successes. But at the same time, there is no doubt about the fact that uh, the uh, there is scope for improvement. I think one of the best faces of the Indian, uh, of the in, in, intelligence community was way back during the pre years preceding the 1971 war and during the 1971 war that is uh, which led to the creation of bangladesh at that time the intelligence the indian intelligence setup was at its finest uh, if if you if you actually go ahead and read uh, you know about the 1971 war you will really understand that the uh, research analysis wing, the newly created research analysis wing, had such fine officers who had in-depth knowledge about every single military movement that was happening, not just in Eastern Pakistan, which is Pakistan, or which is Bangladesh now, but also the Western uh, uh, Pakistan, the, 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 the current Pakistan. So you had, uh, you had uh, information coming out right from the uh, you know, the army headquarters right from the president's office, you still had information coming in. So I think the 1971 war was uh, by far, that period by far was one of the shining examples of uh, the success of the Indian intelligence community. Okay, I have a question coming in from Kalankar and he's asking, okay, just a sec, he's asking, given the situation where Taliban seems to set to capture Kabul sooner, then later is India the biggest loser in this saga? All our investments in Afghanistan will come to naught once the Taliban regains. Should India provide arms, cash to the legitimate government in Kabul to help them throughout the Taliban offense? Um, okay, just a sec. Yeah. So, so uh, the situation, this. The current situation in Afghanistan is really troubling, not just for India, but for everyone in the world. Now, uh, there is no doubt about the fact that there is a resurgence of Taliban. Taliban is pushing in, pushing in. Uh, you have multiple districts that have fallen into the hands of uh, the Taliban, and this uh, this uh, remains a matter of concern for other countries as well as for India. Now, India has uh, has has uh, has invested a lot, uh, significantly, in Afghanistan. In comparison to what it has done in other countries, uh, India doesn't really uh, India doesn't have any boots on the ground. But we do have uh, given some sort of military, uh, certain military equipment to the Afghanistan forces. You have the Afghanistan Army Chief uh, who will be traveling to India uh, uh, later this month. Uh, and see, in, in, in Afghanistan, it's not just the Taliban that is of India's concern. In Afghanistan, it's not just Pakistan that is India's concern. Remember that there is also a role player that is in play that, that would be China. So uh, Pakistan has real good influence in Afghanistan. It has good control over uh, the larger part of the Taliban. Uh, but, then, uh, but then China has control over Pakistan. So it would be China indirectly controlling the situation in Afghanistan. So India doesn't have to worry just about the Taliban and Pakistan, but also about China. Uh, but I think uh, I think India uh, has India has had a fairly uh, uh, built good relationship with Afghanistan. I think the uh, common Afghanis know that India is a friend. India is for development. India has not invested uh, militarily into Afghanistan. India has always uh, you know ended up building roads, building infrastructure. For the Afghan people, so India, uh, India does have a good name out there, but then uh, whatever happening in Afghanistan is actually very troubling per se. Okay, uh, I have then I have a question. This is okay, there are many questions that are there. Um, I think um, there is a question coming in from from Sharma, who is from Agra and is a student. And he says, hi, Alex. I'm very curious to know how people of Valley perceive Indian Army youth. News report says that radicalized is a true condition of women in the Valley due to consciousness, conscious health and education facility disturbed. <clears throat> so Kashmir uh, is a totally different ball game. And um, not necessarily that whatever that you see in Kashmir is, is true. 
uh, uh, there are a lot of things that happen behind the scenes. So you you could have um, you could have uh, Kashmiri. So it's it's so you you would see you know videos and pictures of. Uh, you know, uh, many, uh, some people in Kashmir pelting stones, attacking the security forces. Uh, but you also have seen pictures and videos of thousands of these youngsters turning up at uh, army recruitment drives. Um, and also remember that uh, a lot, many of them joined the Jammu and Kashmir police also, which I, which I feel is one of the finest police forces in the country. They've sacrificed a lot. They've come from within that same society and fight uh, uh, to keep the Indian flag flying high. Now, uh, as far as the situation, uh, as far as the education in Kashmir is concerned, there is no doubt about the fact that, uh, you know, besides, of course, the corona pandemic, but uh, the curfew and the restrictions that were brought in after uh, the removal of Article 370 has has indeed affected the, uh, the education uh, sector there. Uh, while internet is free, it's only later that it, you know internet has been uh, has been opened up. But there are a number of uh, uh, there, there were a number of areas uh, which did not even have Wi-Fi or broadband connections, which does, did affect the education sector there. And the question is how how do uh, the Kashmiris perceive the army? I think uh, the uh, as I said, you know, the large there are a large number of youngsters. You know, who've turned up for army rallies and all. I'm not saying that uh, everybody in Kashmir really loves the army. I think, uh, but at the same time, I would not also say that everybody in uh, Kashmir completely hate the army as well. Then I have a question coming in from, okay, just a sec. Well, I have a question coming in from Rajiv. Do you see India-China border standoff resolving before the winter sets in? Uh, well, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm hesitant to speculate, but it was it was uh, uh, early last year. I think the crisis began in in May. It was in uh, mid June, uh, or maybe in early June, when I reported that the crisis could last very long and into the winter, still the winters. You know, um, I have spoken to multiple uh, people in the defense and security establishment. We speak on almost on a daily basis, interactions are there. And the sense that, I've, uh, that I get is that uh, this particular standoff uh, would, uh, is likely to, uh, you know, go through this second set of winters as well. And probably much more. So the uh, the standoff will continue for quite some time. Is 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 the sense that I get from what the people in the defense and security establishment feel. So uh, okay, I'll have a okay. I have a question coming in from just a second. I have a question coming in from Aditya Sharma, and uh, he's asked me a question. Uh, Hi, Dutyar. I'm more curious to know how tribals in the higher reaches of JNK perceive Indian Army. Moreover, your known relation with people of your own relationship with people of Kashmir. Well, uh, the the tribals uh, uh, along the border region, uh, you know, the, the army maintains the security forces maintain a good relationship with them. Um, how in, you know? Of course, there are elements uh, within there who you know who support the infiltrators, but that is more for money than anything else. And at the same time, there are many who actually tip off uh, the army and the security forces about infiltrators who who come in. Uh, as far as my own relationship with Kashmir is concerned, I've traveled to Kashmir I think numerous times. Uh, Kashmir for me is one, one of the most beautiful places that I've visited. Uh, I have, uh, you know, friends in, 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 in Kashmir, you know, and these friends would last me a lifetime. And, and my friends are not just limited to uh, the defense and security establishment, it goes beyond. And uh, so if you ever get an opportunity to go to Kashmir, please go and visit Kashmir. Uh, you know, don't worry about, uh, you know, uh, the, the all the reports that you keep reading and seeing. As I mentioned earlier, I think I've been to Kashmir at least 25 to 30 times uh, in the last uh, four or five years. So, and I've traveled extensively through Kashmir. 
I've I've never faced any trouble in Kashmir, you know, I've, and I don't travel with uh, security or for that or anything else. I travel just like how anyone uh, would normally travel. Of course, when I'm with the army, you know, we move in army convoys and all. But then I've moved around on my own uh, for reporting and meeting out with friends. So uh, if you do get a chance, uh, you know, I think you should definitely visit Kashmir. Uh, thank you so much, uh, you know, for uh, sending in your questions and. Uh, you know, for attending this particular interaction, it's great to have you all on board. Uh, and as I said, thank you so much for supporting the print, for subscribing to the print. Uh, you know, it was because of uh, people like you that, uh, you know, we as reporters, that is me and my colleagues, are able to travel out and get you stories that matter. Because at the print, uh, we just don't believe in uh, uh, reporting uh, every development, but we also focus on reporting news that you should know and should be aware of. So please continue to uh, keep supporting the print. Uh, thanks a lot for logging in and spending your time with me.